I'm uh, the Vice President of Canadian Operations for Procore. Um, so I've been with the business for about six years. I run Canadian Operations, and it's everything from pre-sales to post-sales. Uh, we have a really cool team up in Canada, uh, across Toronto and Vancouver, uh, with about 100 plus people. Uh, we also have uh, a thousand plus uh, fantastic customers. Uh, that span everything from owners, general contractors, to specialty contractors and beyond. Um, so really uh, grateful uh, to be here and, and have the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, introducing to my right, uh, Christina Roy. I don't know, Christina, if you want to just uh, tell the press a little bit about yourself. Sure, yeah. Uh, first 10 years as a site manager, site engineer, and then the next uh, 20 years I've been doing uh, scheduling. Um, I'm also a huge advocate for EDI in construction. I do quite a lot of um, uh, public speaking on EDI in the UK and uh, I belong to uh, quite a number of organisations on, on that particular subject. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, thanks Christina. Allah uh, Hiru. Hi, I'm Allah Hiru. Uh, my background is in civil engineering, uh, all my graduate studies are in uh, project management. I have worked for PCL construction as well as uh, Sanko Energy before I joined the academia and currently I'm working as instructor in uh, Southern Alberta Institute of Technology's construction project management program that's the only degree program on construction management currently running uh, in Canada and also uh, on my spare time I work with uh, Pathfind Institute out of Cheney, New Jersey, a consultancy arm on project management and uh, predominantly I work for them on construction productivity issues. Um, and before we jump to today, thanks, Lahiru. So um, I don't know if you ever, if you uh, all picked this up on the keynote yesterday, uh, but Tui uh, talked about Procore.org, um, and so um, SAIT is one of the benefactors of that program, and we've got other colleges in Canada. Uh, but regardless of what region you're all from, um, if you have like deans or professors or schools that you work with uh, that you want to connect us with, like please let us know. Uh, we'd love to get in touch and provide Procore at no charge. We've got an ex exceptional. Uh, curri curriculum that we can put together for those institutions as well. SAIT's a good example of that. And then hopefully graduate the next uh, batch of uh, construction professionals uh, in a way that's meaningful, uh, in a way that actually adds value on the job site on day one uh, and gives them sort of like some really cool tech tools that they can bring to market as well. So do, do let us know. Uh, catch me at the end of the show and I'll be happy to take down names and, and what have you. Uh, Dave? Yeah, I'm Dave Schmeiler. Uh, I'm a project manager at Adura Development. We're in Vancouver, BC. Um, we do uh, <laughs> multifamily residential, so I'm a project manager for them. I also oversee our quality control and our service department. All right, thank you. Okay, let's get, get, let's get into it. So um, I think maybe just kicking off, uh, and I'll start with uh, you, Lahiru. Uh, but in your opinion, like, what are some of the main uh, reasons contributing to the global labor shortage today from your perspective? So when you look at the labor shortage in general, this can happen for two reasons. One is we don't have enough workers, and another one is the mismatch. In terms of there are people, there are opportunities, but there's a mismatch. So currently, when you look at Canada in the next five years, and we might not have enough students or like the younger generation coming into construction. So whether the market is hot or like from the Alberta perspective, if I talk, whether the oil and gas market is hot or oil and gas market is down, always we have seen this particular shortage. So the main, I think, is the lack of students or lack of younger generation come to this particular industry. Awesome. Thanks, Leroux. And, and uh, you mentioned uh, oil and gas, um, like so the boom, boom and bust of, of that yeah. cycle. Um, and, you know, in terms of the folks that you're trying to attract into SAIT today, um, you know, what tools are you putting in place in order to get folks into your organization and, and through your institution? So uh, specifically in SAIT, uh, what we try to do, we try to go to high schools and talk to students and understand uh, how they would like to come into construction and post well as we have open houses where they can come and uh, try some of the skills. In uh, say the difference is not like in a, any other university being a polytechnic, we train the tradesmen up to construction managers. So we have everything from like uh, steel workers to plumbers, electricians, so from that end up to construction management graduates we train also. We have seen 
a lot. So we try to approach them through social media as well as open houses and many other ways to make sure we can attract the younger generation and also inside say it, uh, later on we can talk about it like we have like women in trade sort of initiatives so how we can bring the other sectors into construction. So thanks and Dave what's uh, in, in your estimation some of the primary reasons? People don't really want to do the physical work they don't want to put the time in to learn it that's that's what I see uh, with our company and with the trades we're working with they're really struggling just getting getting these young people who want to get out there and get dirty. That's a, a good point, and I think one thing uh, that you know we try and encourage as well, like at least from our perspective at Procor, is really uh, establishing the trades as a as a STEM field, like something that can excite them and get them. Yeah, you know, we talked about that at the keynote yesterday. Again, I think it was Tui or Wyatt uh, talked about this thing in your pocket, right? And that's ultimately how folks want to work. Uh, so there's an element of getting dirty, but I guess also an element of how do we you know tell that story differently, right? Which I think has an impact. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, technology is it, the phone, right? It's part of the work now. Uh, and there's exciting things. Uh, we'll talk about more about mass timber and other things that young ones can get excited or, or new people to the industry can get excited about. But it's just educating them too. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Christina, you've got a bit of a different perspective from the UK. And uh, can yep. you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, in the UK, there's a 266,000 uh, labour shortage over the next, well, that's what we're looking for for the next five years. So there's a mass massive hill to climb. And I work in the front end of construction. So I work out on site. I work for a main contractor. And I see this firsthand all the time that, you know, we're struggling to find good design managers, uh, architects, um, you know, site managers, uh, tradespeople. And, uh, you know, they're just not, not there. Projects are really struggling. And, um, you know, uh, as you mentioned earlier, that we, we have the same issue with an aging uh, workforce that are retiring. I think there's about 20% in the sort of above the age of 55 to 65 are actually uh, looking at retiring in the next five years. Um, we have a big issue in, in the UK as well about the image of construction and culture of construction and uh you know attracting the the next generation into the industry that you know kids just aren't interested in in joining construction you know it's cold it's dirty in england uh we work long hours lots of long commuting you know in my career i must have traveled thousands and thousands of miles up and down england to to get to projects you know so kids can see you know they they sort of see the image and and don't want to work in the industry they go to other stem industries and 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 so the you know the challenge is is massive uh, for the next you know five years. Maybe let's just stay with you for a bit, Christina. So like yeah. going into like how do you solve for that? Uh, you talked about STEM. You talked about EDI when you sort of like kicked mm. off at the beginning. Like yeah. what are some of the strategies that you've put in place or you uh, mm. associations you work with and what's worked for you? Yeah, sure. Um, and one thing I just uh, didn't mention was Brexit as well. You've probably all heard about Brexit. We're in the UK. We're sick and tired of Brexit. Um, and you can see what's happening in the UK. You know, we're, we're you know we're as a country. I think we're you know some of us are really regressing uh, Brexit, and you know consequences of that are that we've you know we've lost people to back you know have gone back to Europe um, because of Brexit. So so we but you know all industries are struggling. You know you can see the healthcare system as well with the news at the moment. Uh, really struggling on that. So, um, you know, one of the, I, th I think EDI, you know, this conference has been, a lot of it's been about EDI. And um, certainly in the UK, there's a massive movement, I think, going on across, uh, you know, the whole industry on EDI, um, you know, from the big organizations to the tier ones. Um, our Chartered Institute of Building, which is a global organization, but ba obviously based in the UK. Um, you know, they're rolling out a, uh, you know, a lots of EDI initiatives at the moment. Um, they've got a, a new charter that is, is out there, and I think that's been pushed out globally. And, uh, you know, that charter is designed to actually uh, improve the culture of the industry. And, and obviously, you know, the knock-on effects of that is to actually make it a place where people want to come and work. Um, there's also other organisations, so I don't know if you've heard of the supply chain, uh, well, the Sustainability Supply Chain School. Um, it's a really excellent uh, organisation in the UK, but easy to find on the internet. A lot of the trades companies uh, belong to this, uh, contractors belong to this organisation. And they have an initiative uh, called uh, Fairness, Inclusion, Respect. 
and uh, they run out uh, fur ambassadors, and I'm a gold uh, fur ambassador. And uh, if you, you go on to the, the website, you'll see they've got webinars on there, they've got e-learning, they have role models, they've got case studies, uh, best practice examples, uh, all around EDI and, uh, you know, designed to actually change the, you know, the culture of the industry, make it a place that is safer and better and, and where people actually want to belong. Yeah. So there's that. And, and also um, the tier one contractors, I've worked for six uh, tier one main contractors, including Balfour BT, which I know is over here in the US. Um, a lot of the, the tier ones all now have employer resource groups, you know, from LGBT groups to gender groups, disability, ethnicity, uh, ex-offenders, uh, families, all, all of those are now being sort of targeted to, to basically make their companies more inclusive and draw people into to the companies. So it's become quite a competitive thing. And, you know, part of the business case uh, is obviously retention, uh, recognition, reward, and, uh, you know, keeping their staff. So, you know, these organisations, these uh, employee resource groups really do make a difference in terms of attracting new talent, but also keeping talent. Yeah, that's really, really good um, uh, points and also good, great resources. I think you mentioned when we were talking earlier about you being the chair of the Balfour BT yeah. network. Um, uh, so tell us yeah. a little bit about that. Because yeah. I think really what, you know, is interesting to me is like in complex small or large contractors, like building these programs can be, uh, can seem like a bit of a mountain to climb. Uh, it's difficult to get them off the ground. Like any tips or tricks you can give folks here? Yeah, on? sure. So, um, so I worked in, in uh, construction 20 years and I actually transitioned at uh, Balfour BT uh, because they launched a, an LGBT employee resource group. And it was because they launched it back in 2014. Um, I saw this, uh, the launch of a network and I actually, for the first time in my career, felt that I, I actually was at a place where I belonged. And uh, it changed my life. I, I went on to transition, and obviously this was like eight years ago now, and a lot's moved on, and a lot happier. And we talked obviously downstairs at the keynote about mental health, and for a long time I struggled with my mental health, um, with panic attacks and everything, uh, because I couldn't be myself. And so the employee resource groups actually, you know, made it, you know the company a place where I could actually, for the first time, feel like I belonged. And I, you know, stayed in the industry because I was looking, you know, I, I was actually looking around to find companies, uh, STEM companies, where I could actually be myself. So, but, uh, you know, to answer the question, you know, we, we went on to, to develop the uh, employee resource group, the LGBT network, and, and grew it, and we won awards. And, um, you know, it took a lot of work. Keeping it going and keeping the momentum going is really tough. Often it's, you know, a small group of people running the employee resource groups. And, uh, you know, you need a sponsor, you know, you, you want backup from the, the top of a company. We had uh, chief executive support, Leo Quinn, uh, was actually behind all the employee resource groups. And uh, it, having a communications plan and actually putting your, putting your messaging out there to, you know, about what, why we're here, what it's for, you know, the changing of policies and using inclusive language and uh, stamping out inappropriate language, bullying, all that sort of thing, you know, is really part of the agenda. So, you know, it made the difference to the company and that went on to develop other employee resource groups into including disability groups and ethnicity groups. So it changed the company. Awesome, yeah. Really, really, really powerful. Thank, thanks for sharing that, Christina. Um, Dave, uh, I think there's a recruitment and a retention sort of question here, which I think uh, Christina covered. And then there's sort of the efficiency side of things. Like, how have you uh, seen, uh, you know, uh, this, in terms of solutions for, for the industry? Like, how have you leveraged uh, tools on the job site, technology and things like that to get more efficient and, you know, do more with less ultimately? Yeah, exactly. That's the word is efficiency for us because um, we still have a labor shortage. So what we find is using Procore, right? Everything that we're here to learn about. So uh, POs, deficiency tools, the drawings, everything being on Procore allows our site guys, um, the, the trades, the PMs, to, to know what's going on and to do it quickly and efficiently because otherwise, you know, I was telling a, a company this morning, we used to write paper POs. I don't know if anybody here still writes paper POs, but that takes a lot of time. And then you gotta send the POs in. If you lose a PO, you're in trouble. So the efficiency of using Procore has been largely beneficial, uh, but also our building practices. So we are a big proponent of mass timber. 
Uh, if you haven't heard of Mass Timber or CLT, please go to our website, check it out. Uh, it's going to change the construction industry, but uh, what you can do with it is you can prefab it, plan it, drill all your mechanical holes, get it all ready, send it to site, you can frame ex you know, quite quickly with it, and then all the trades like it because everything's already done ready for them. Uh, and then your, your building practice, your, it goes a lot faster. You need less framing trades, uh, everything goes quicker. So uh, for us, we're trying to be efficient. We're trying to find a way to deal with less people, but still go as quick as we can and save costs where we can too, right? We're all in this uh, as a business, so we, we have to make money to do it, but we've got to be efficient doing it. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. And then just taking the efficiency thing one, one step further with Lahiru, um, you know, it's, uh, we, we actually had a Dodge data report that we uh, commissioned about two years ago, I think it was. Uh, one of the findings from that was that 20% uh, of the contractors surveyed um, the predominant sort of uh, opinion was that 20% of the time that they spend uh, was on suboptimal tasks, right? And so there's a level of efficiency that we can gain through increased productivity um, and just improving the amount of time we're actually spending on tools. Um, and I know Lahiru is an educator. You've done a lot of research on this. I'd, I'd love if you could share some of that with the folks here as well. So when you look at this labor shortage problem, there are many ways we can skin this cat. One way would be like how we can increase the productivity of the workforce. When you look at the workforce, there are two things we can do. One is how we can make sure your frontline supervision staff is on the job site rather than going back and forth as much as possible in the workforce. So in the work phase. So when you look at all these technologies downstairs, they are in the expo hall. Like think about like when you want to do the capturing of uh, the quantities like some of these vendors talking about like reality capture and then think about in the mechanical systems or walls or anything like how long it will take for a crew to measure versus like you can just do the reality capture and how much time you can save and on the other hand when you look at a crew typically we measure two things one is their productivity that means how many widgets they produce in a given hour like the rate of placement and other one is how efficient is the crew we call that winch time or the tool time typically when you look at construction what we have seen like it's 40 to 50 percent like the effective time of a crew in a typical day they have tool time or the productive time and then they have the support in time which is like doing the toolbox meeting, safety things and other ones. And then there's ineffective time, like searching for material, looking for material, waiting for instructions and things like that. To improve that particular time, you can use a lot of these technologies. So we can make sure that crew is working. I'm not saying we can push it to 70, 80%. We all are human beings and there are limits we can push. But if we can stop the idle time and looking for materials and things like that, through the technologies. So we can make sure with the limited crew we have, we can get more done. And also when you look at the accidents and other ones typically happen in unplanned work. So if we can use better project management as well as better technologies, we should be able to stop many of the work stoppages. And also the rework and other things because your supervision staff can do suboptimal tasks Jazz was talking about. Rather than doing that, if they can do the optimal tasks, we should be able to stop many of the accidents and also stop many of the rework. So the time on tools sort of a tools are really good to debug a crew and see what is your main issue. Is it the information? Is it for instruction? Is it the material? What's happening with the crew? Awesome, thank you. Um, in, in just, just sort of pivoting a bit, like uh, outside of like productivity and efficiency, like one thing I think everyone's sort of focused on is how do we get the next generation of talent in? I know you have some specific programs on kind of, you know, attracting high schoolers into, into the trades and uh, into trade schools. Like, can you tell us a little bit about that? So when I talked to the high schoolers, what Dave was talking about specifically, like, do you want to be a licensed tradesman? One of the major complaints is, okay, it might pay me initially 22 bucks. If I talk to work to Starbucks or like Tim Hortons, I might get 18, I might get 20. So for extra two, three dollars, why should I do the brackbaking work outside 
especially in Canada when it is minus 20, minus 30, <laughs> with a lot of snowstorm, and why should I do it? What they don't understand is, especially the trade school side of things, in the Canadian system, if you want to become an apprentice, they are virtually paying nothing for those four years because they are only staying inside an institute for eight weeks while they are studying. Let's say it's a tradesman in plumbing. In the first year, they will introduce certain concepts and theories and hold the other time other than those eight weeks, they are inside the institute. They are working for a plumbing contract or a mechanical contractor. So after four years, when they become a licensed tradesman, their rates go up considerably compared to being in a Starbucks, so I'm not saying bad to be a barrister, like, but in general, they can have better systems, but we need to understand how the kids think. Like, when we talk with them, they're talking about, what about the job security? As an industry, we have this hiring and firing, like, the job is done, you're gone. So how about the future, and how about the like insurance and how about retirement plans and other things. When you look at uh, majority of the contractors are small ones. We have like super big ones like when you look at Turner or PCL or other ones. But if you look at a contractor with five, ten of a crew, rather than they are negotiating for these benefits, I think that's where the trade associations comes in. If they can negotiate with insurance providers and other benefit systems, and as a whole, if we can create that sort of a safety net, we might be able to bring back the kids into construction. A lot of people talk about immigration. I don't think that's a permanent solution. That's a temporary bandage. But we need to understand what kids need these days, what they're ticking their mind. And also, when you look at the high school programs, especially the career guidance counselors and the parents, they are the ones who are influencing. So if you have better like trades programs, I'm saying like woodworking and metalwork and other things, if they can become fond of these things, they will come into the industry in the long run. They might not be want to be a tradesman, at least if they come for engineering or any other technology related fields in construction because not only blue collar workers, we have a huge shortage in white collar as well. So nowadays, as in one of the sessions yesterday, the graduates can dictate the terms for the companies. Okay, that person is paying me X amount of dollars, are you willing to pay that? Then I'll work for you. So we have to think about all this as a whole, as an industry, if we want to have a permanent solution for this chronic problem for how many decades? Like we were talking about women in construction, women in engineering, for how long? And why are we still talking about it? Are we solving it? One of the best examples I can give you, like a couple of weeks ago when we have another conference, one of the women who is in the audience says, you all talk about this, but when I want to buy a coverall, I don't have my sizes. In female sizes, and so can't we solve that? And like we have to look at this overall, and are we trying to solve the right problem, or are we just talking about it? That's the main issue, I believe. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, female sizes, you know, for PPE or other equipment, uh, toilets on site, you know, uh, just really simple solutions sometimes that just make those workplaces a lot more inclusive. Um, just want to, like, again, just pivot real quick here, just to technology specifically. Um, uh, maybe, Christina, start with you. Just like, how have you seen, whether it's Procore, just technology in general, uh, how do you see those tools really helping you, um, yeah. you know, get more efficient? Yeah, um, I mean, I've, I've been, as I say, in the industry 30 years, and I, the industry in the UK has been so slow to ad ad adopt technology, and so it's no wonder, you know, kids aren't, you know, seeing the industry as a um, as a place to go, really. But it's been, you know, it's really reassuring, isn't it? The last sort of three or four years, uh, you know, technology has has come on leaps and bounds, uh, you know, from use of drones to 4D modelling uh, to software like Procore. You know, it's it really has changed, and um, you know, I think, you know, at last we're it's it's modernising, and uh, I think that will draw, you know, the next generation into the industry for sure. Yeah, I think you're a scheduler by trade, right? Yeah. And planner yeah. by trade. So yeah. uh, things like workforce planning, I'll do a shameless plug, right? But really. Uh, amazing solution to better deploy resources on the job site, get them 
to the place they need to be at the time they need to be there. So you're just sort of, again, reducing the amount of suboptimal work that you're doing. Um, so if anyone hasn't checked out workforce planning downstairs or the, the labor chart acquisition that we made last year, um, definitely that's one tool that can really help uh, increase efficiency on the job site in a, in a really meaningful way. The ROI kind of writes itself. Um, uh, Dave, I know you've been a customer for about four years. Uh, any, any tips and tricks you take away from how you've deployed Procore, how you've used Procore in, in your business in order to drive some of that efficiency? Yeah, we've been, uh, I got to go to the Austin Groundbreak with you back in 2018. So we've been doing this for a little while now. Uh, we've kind of worked through the, uh, the bugs as it were for our company. Um, some of the biggest things we've taken away from it is just, yeah, the, like the RFIs, the, uh, the way to track information and the transparency that we see has been huge. Um, we've saved a lot of time by going to Procore and we also uh, kind of keep upper management happier because they can, they can see what's going on, right? Uh, it's, it's right at their fingertips as well. And, you know, to your point about bringing in young ones too, you know, technology is, is fun. You know, the keynote this morning was really good about that because that's, you know, it, it makes construction more exciting. So for young ones to learn it, to, to use their phone and be able to be on their phone somewhat through the day uh, can actually be a benefit for them. Yeah. You know, and I think everyone here can have an impact. I was just thinking as you were saying that, like I'm, I've got a kid who's in grade nine right now and she's doing tech class for the first time. And in tech, they, they teach you BIM modeling uh, and, you know, other, other types of like build a build a bottle rocket and all that kind of stuff, which is super fun. And she's like really into it. And so I actually went on parent teacher night and spoke to the, the teacher about using Procore, right? And so that we've opened up a discussion now Hopefully it's something we can get into that class and then we can sort of expand it into that, uh, into the school district where I live. Uh, but I think there's small things that we can all do, right? In order to, it doesn't have to be wait for someone to make that change. You know, we can all be that change. We all have children or other people that we know that are going through high school or some variation of it, that we can have an impact in the way that those courses are taught and the tools that are used. So, um, you know, definitely if, if anyone has any questions about that or you want to find a way that you can, you know, get Procore uh, used in those situations, like uh, reach out to me for sure. But yeah, thank, thanks so much. Um, I know we're probably, uh, Dana, we're probably short of time, correct? We're good? Should we move to questions? Yeah. All right. Okay, go ahead, Larue. So regarding the technology, what Jazz was talking about, what I like about Procore is based on my experience with PCL and Sanko and others in the industry, Proco is a true integrated platform because there are many aspects you can do where if you replace with five other softwares, then the problem is about information double handling, information integration, is it correct? What's where? And also you have like true integration with your tech partners. So based on our research before, like I'm talking about 2014, 2015 period, frontline supervision staff lose like 100 to 120 minutes about this information double handling. I have to do this in this system and then get it to Excel or somewhere and then upload it to somewhere else rather than just doing one time yeah. in one platform. So that is the true power of technology rather than doing it a siloed approach. So that's why I like about Proco as a system or as a platform. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point actually. And I, I don't know if anyone caught this, it was very brief in passing. Uh, but I think it was during Wyatt's session yesterday, but they talked about data intelligence and they talked about some of those cool features like just the global search capability in Procore, right? Just the things you wouldn't know, ordinarily think about, uh, but those are the kinds of things that can allow you to scan the entire platform in a common data environment, uh, get insights at your fingertips, right? And if uh, you haven't looked at uh, tools like analytics uh, yet, uh, that's really what we're talking about, data intelligence, right? Can we uh, take all the available endpoints that we have in the database and serve those back up with rich insights in your business? So perhaps you can start tracking historical projects against active projects. You can make some leading uh, insights as opposed to lagging insights. And then as we start thinking about Procore as a data company moving forward, uh, we take the aggregate insights that we've built up over, you know, 100 plus countries and however many billions of uh, construction volume that runs through the platform and then serve those back up to our customers in, a, in an anonymized fashion that adds value to you as well. So I think those are the types of things to your point around an integrated platform and you can use that common data environment to, to really uh, extrapolate some, some, some key findings for your business and, and get more efficient. Yeah, especially with the amount of data you have inside Proco, like especially with analytics. Now you should be easily see in the future, 
like okay what's the industry average versus what's my estimate versus how my crew is doing and can we predict even if you look at the safety side of things like okay from the analytics what are the top three or four safety incident can happen in this sort of a site safety productivity and quality all in the data so in then you can train the staff beforehand you commence the project so you can eliminate using the Pareto analysis or 80 20 rule we always talk about those 20 percent of the causes which contributes 80 percent if you can manage those 20 percent 80 percent of your headache is gone so we are moving in the right way in terms of data and analytics so it will be a powerful tool yeah. in future yeah and things like general conditions insights and other things will will we'll add to that for sure um, okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Uh, should we move to questions? Does anyone have uh, uh, something they want? It might be just like one or two questions. Okay, okay. Uh, so it has to be a really special question in that case. Yeah. Four minutes Yeah. I've, I, I, I'm, okay, gentleman in the back. So I appreciate the comment um, the couple of you made about immigration as a solution and, and also prefabrication. But robotics, So based my experience in oil and gas, I have seen like welding and other robots, like it will improve for sure. Like robots is a solution, but I don't know whether the technology is developed at that stage. I have seen some applications. It's coming up in next three to four years. I believe it'll change the industry. And sometimes those exoskeletons as well in the research areas we have, like increasing the capacities of workers without tarring them. So you will be able to use the workers in optimum level rather than going into the suboptimal task. But if you look at the Boston Dynamic robots and other ones, I think the cost is the entry barrier, like one of those robots costs like $250,000. So then like, what's the point? Like with the mass production, the cost will come down. So I think in next two, three to five years, yeah, we'll see a dramatic change in the industry. I've got an interesting one as well, just just on the uh, Boston Dynamics one specifically. So I was actually talking to a customer a couple of weeks ago that's uh, piloting the, the dogs on a couple of job sites. And um, I said, How, how's that going? Because I know you're, you're kind of into this stuff. And his comment back to me was, it's going great. They love it. They're getting a lot of insights from, from the dog. But one sort of unintended thing that I never thought about, because if you watch the Boston Dynamics uh, video, it's the dog walking around at nighttime on a job site. They actually can't do that because of the liability issues that come with it. So in fact, what happens is the superintendent walks with the dog, you know, um, around the job site. You still capture a ton of really fantastic insights, but the use case sort of changes a little bit. So I think to your point, we're getting there. It's like baby steps, but robotics will be a big will have a big impact, an outsized impact in the future for sure as we improve some of those uh, tools. Yeah, and just for, the, for us on the construction site, uh, to be honest, there's not a lot that the robots can do as far as constructing the building. Uh, it's really what we see a lot of is the prefab. So it's going through a BIM model. Uh, it's figuring out what you need. And even for plumbers and stuff, they can get pipes pre-cut, everything. So it's like Lego, you just piece it together. That's the big cost savings and time savings that we're seeing. One more question. I've got the one minute sign up. Okay. <laughs> well, one question. Don't be shy. Frederico, you got a question? No. <laughs> I have one question. All right, shoot. So based on my experience with working for PCL, especially I work for their software division, when you look at implemented solutions, we look at, in terms of solution, what's the capital cost as well as what's the running cost. And then we look at the benefits in terms of time saving and lack of errors or like lack of rework. And we look at all these things and try to come up with the ROI. Like even with the upkeep cost, if it is like either break even, because when you look at technologies, there are two things like one is bleeding edge, other one is leading edge. If you want to be a leading company, you have to invest in the bleeding edge technologies in the early stage in the technology adaptation curve. So when the technology become a household thing, 
you can be one of the leaders so even if it is not making money if it is break even i always say do a pilot and test it out and then work with the vendor to kink the bugs so in the long run it will make you money absolutely good one um folks thank you so much for spending the time really appreciate it thank you for the speakers really thank appreciate you. all your insights